Every time. I should introduce, so the theme of this tour, I think you all know, is, is humor in the collection. Um, and I had thought of that idea a long time ago because it was just right around April Fool's Day and I thought, well, that'll be great. There's probably a lot of funny paintings that we can use. Um, and then as I started to try to find objects for the, the tour, I was real realizing we have a lot of very serious subjects and maybe less that are um, a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, so Erin and I put our heads together and we came up with the list of five different works that we're going to talk about today. Um, none of them necessarily are ha ha, laugh out loud, funny. But we're hoping that we'll have sort of a broad definition of humor. There are moments of levity. There are sort of raucous characters, you know, being goofy and things like that. Um, so we're going to find the humor in the, the works that we have presented to you. And to, to sort of sweeten the deal and up the ante, I have found some really corny, terrible jokes that I'll tell at the end of each painting so that you're getting your money's worth on the humor front. But um, as we get started, so this is the first painting. Uh, that we want to talk about today. And is everyone, everyone can see it okay? Not if it's working? Okay. And of course, the experience of viewing a painting on a computer screen or an iPad screen is not the same as being in the gallery, but in some ways, um, there are some benefits. So this is a painting that's often, I think, sort of harder to see. It's in Gallery 18 at the museum, and it's not um, something I think a lot of visitors have spent some time with. So what we can do is I've got the painting itself and then I've gotten got little details that I'll click through and show you um, so you can really get a sense of, of the work and the artist's hand at play. Um, but as we start here, it's a little bit hard to make out, but I want to throw it right to you. What is going on in this image? And you might have to kind of peer at your screen because there's a lot of little details there. So anyone who wants to unmute and, and just chime in, what's going on here? All right, Ingrid, yes. And I'm wondering, Ingrid, if your audio is working now? You're unmuted, so are you, let's see. Or she may be able to add something to the chat. Yeah, maybe Ingrid, if you can use the chat, because we can't get your audio to work. So while Ingrid's writing that chat for us, who else wants to, to jump in? What's going on here? Okay. Laura? Um, it, yes, Mary, it, go ahead. It looks like a beauty parlor for monkeys. Okay, it looks like a beauty parlor for monkeys. And what do you see that makes you say that? Well, all the characters look like chimpanzees or monkeys. Mm -hmm. It's obviously uh, not in this period. And the things that are happening make me think that maybe this is what an old fashioned beauty parlor might have looked like. I see on the sort of left foreground, uh, the monkey behind the great basin that's on the floor looks to be having a shave. Mm -hmm. uh, the monkey on the right m looks to be maybe being fitted for shoes. I don't know, it's, it's very interesting. I wish I'd noticed this in the gallery. I'm gonna go and look at it. <laughs> Okay, so a couple, so you're thinking, well, first of all, you've sort of helped us place it uh, temporally. This is, doesn't look like a, a scene from today um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and then you're noticing too that um, the monkeys seem to be engaged in maybe some grooming rituals or something that has to do almost with the beauty parlor. You're looking specifically at that um, first kind of foreground image on the left side that Aaron is helpfully <laughs> pointing to for me, um, where there's a monkey who seems to be being shaved, perhaps, sitting in, in yes. front of the basin. And then when you were talking about maybe being fitted for shoes, were you talking about the, the lower right image that's going on over there? I was, and I thought I could see a, a boot, but now that I enlarged the screen, I realize it's not. So I guess the one on the right is being introduced to the monkey who's going to be working on him or her. <laughs> Okay, so if this is a if this is some sort of beauty shop that you know this is the client who's come in and he's being introduced to the person who will be re grooming him for the day. I love it. Anyone else want to chime in with things you're noticing? Um, and I, I do have more details that I can show you that are a bit zoomed in. But just right off the bat, any other thoughts or observations? Well, overall, I think it's a mockery of human behavior mm. and human interaction. Uh, maybe mocking us for taking ourselves so seriously a little bit. Okay, I love this. So Jim is saying that it maybe is a mockery of human behavior. And and what what how did you get that sense? What what makes you think it's a mockery of, of humans? 
Well, on the lower right, the uh, conversation that they're having and the mm. uh, excessive gesticulations that mm. seem uh, probably more than necessary for the uh, normal conversation. Um, just, it just seems like a lot of people taking themselves very seriously. If, okay. they were people, they're, if they were people, but they're not. So they're being mocked. Okay, fair enough. So um, as someone who gestures a lot, I can sort of relate to these monkeys here. I sort of, <laughs> I'm always over gesticulating. Mm -hmm. um, but right, so there's sort of these exaggerated gestures. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. seem to be taking themselves very seriously. For me too, the way that they're dressed gives it sort of a formality. Yes, yes, um, yes. In a very strange way. We're not used to seeing monkeys. Well, I guess sometimes we see monkeys with clothes. But um, so yeah, so there's a sense sort of that they're mocking the, the sincerity of, of humans who are sort of over the top, right, or taking themselves too seriously. I love that. Um, so, so you sort of introduced this idea that perhaps there's a mockery or there's sort of this element of humor. And don't just flatter me because I, I picked this for a humor walk and talk, but do you find this humorous at all? Or what are your responses to the sort of humor or not um, in an image like this? It's a sardonic humor. A sardonic uh, humor. I smile. But sardonically. <laughs> okay, yeah. So this is a sardonic humor. Like I said, I'm not going to have a lot of sort of like visual gags and laugh out loud things for you, but it's close, right? What about anyone else? Do you, do you see, do you find the humor in this image? And again, you don't have to say yes just to make me feel good. I'm not offended. Erin, I, or I should say, Laura, I, the lower right kind of demonstrates class differences to me as well. Mm -hmm. The fellow who this, I think it's his foot stuck out. I can't quite tell. Looks mm -hmm. like he's wearing a long velvet coat and uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but it looks like lace at his wrists and mm -hmm. extremely formally dressed compared to the people who are on their knees and groveling around with different work uh, assignments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. The way that they're dressed, because we had mentioned that they're dressed in human clothes, but there's quite a difference. There's a range in what's being represented. And especially those figures on the far right seem very, very formally dressed, so very, you know, upper class, aristocratic. Um, but some of the other workers are much more informally dressed. So there's certainly perhaps a commentary about social stratification or different classes um, at play here as well. Great. I want to, like I promised, I do have some um, close-up images. So what I wanted to do is walk through some of the details um, that we can see in this painting. So Erin, if you can, yeah. So this is, actually maybe go back one second. So this is, um, if you look, yeah, oh, perfect. On the left side there. Um, so if we zoom in now, you see two monkeys. Hard to make out, um, but I think what they're probably doing is preparing food of some sort. I'm almost wondering if that's a big fish or a, a suckling pig and they're they're, you know, preparing the food. Um, and then as we go back to the, the larger image, it almost seems as though they're standing in front of a big hearth. Um, so maybe they're in a kitchen setting. This isn't to discount Mary's theory that they're in a beauty shop. We're open to all interpretations, but um, perhaps they're hard at work preparing food. And then the next um, is sort of the, the center image. If you look um, where, where there's that, uh, this is good for me to practice my visual description. Yeah, so we have uh, in the center here the monkey that seems to be being groomed. Um, there's a, a, a metal basin at the feet. The monkey maybe is washing his hands and he's either being shaved, the seated monkey, or, or groomed in some way. And then we go back to the, the larger image as we move forward. And then I think the next one I've got is we move to the center figure who's got a basket on his head. And as we zoom into that one. Um, and again, it, it's hard to make out, but it seems like there's perhaps chickens in the basket. Um, it almost looks like a spit with meat on it behind him. And then hanging on the wall, maybe those are, are cloves of garlic or onions. And then there are some additional um, ostensibly monkeys in the back, although that one sort of seems to have a feline face, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, that one. Um, and then as we continue to move um, to the next slide, we work our way across the canvas. So we've got, yeah, if we zoom into that one again, here's so you're a little bit of a um, more close up image of these fancily dressed monkeys. And then the, the monkey who's sort of taking a knee and genuflecting in front of them. And then the final detail I've got is if we move forward this in the back there, um, it's a monkey who is either getting his blood let or is having some sort of dentistry work being done perhaps. Um, again, it's, it's very hard to make out, but there's, he's being attended by these two monkeys, um, and there seems to be sort of a basin underneath his, his mouth. Um, so not entirely sure what's going on there, but uh, something probably I would not want to be a part of. <laughs> 
So as we move forward, so um, again, now that you've had a chance to sort of take in the details, does anyone have any additional thoughts or, or questions that have come up as you look at this painting? And if you want to, you can just take yourself right off mute and chime in if you want. Yeah, Liz? Excuse, excuse me. Is, oh, yeah. If you told us the title of it, I've forgotten. I have not told you the title yet. I think if we click forward, Aaron, I've got the... If you do, I have the the um, title on the slide. I'm not sure if I do. Well, Laura, my other thought was, mm -hmm. which I didn't say, was that they were being prepared for dinner. They're, the monkeys themselves are being prepared for dinner. Yes. Like someone's right. going to eat them. <laughs> exactly. Oh dear. Well, that's a very dark humor. <laughs> it is dark, them. indeed. Yeah. And what did you see that made you think maybe that they were going to be prepared for dinner? because it does look more like a kitchen than a beauty shop, but I was trying to be positive about the monkeys being prepared in beauty. But mm -hmm. I also agree, and I've been trying to think, was it Goya who um, portrayed people as animals and in dark scenes for what we do to ourselves and to others? I'm not, Aaron. do you know the, the artist? That I mean, it's, it, this is not yeah. by Goya, but I know no, there were not. several artists who, who did mm -hmm. this style of work. And I know, Far less than Perhaps, any other, so probably Bosch? in the group. Perhaps it was, it was Bosch. Bosch, no, Bosch were, did, but there was there was a um, hybrid scenes. But I think Goya did as well. I'm tr um, and um, there's another artist whose name is is failing me, but it's around the same time as Goya, um, who was using like animals to represent people and and kind of as a commentary on society and and human behavior. <laughs> and there's certainly this sort of long tradition of, of portraying monkeys um, that dates back to, I think, the 1500s, if not before. Um, this was painted, so here's the, you can now see on your screen, the, the title is Interior with Monkeys, so not an in, incredibly helpful title to help us ascertain what's going on, um, but it was by an Italian artist, uh, Gaspari Diziani, about 1720. Um, so, uh, he, he worked in Germany for a period of time, and in Germany when he was there working, these monkey paintings and images of monkeys were incredibly popular. It was a, it was a trend that got started in, in France and became very popular in France, and the Germans sort of um, appropriated it. It never caught on, the, the craze for monkeys in art never really caught on in Italy, where this artist worked primarily. Um, so we think probably this was done during his time in Germany. Um, in, so this, to me, raises the question, um, what sort of a collector or what sort of a, you know, who would, who would want a painting like this? What does that tell us perhaps about the potential patron of this painting or about the artist himself, if anything? And I guess I could ask you the question, is this something that you would want to display in your home? And if so, why? I'm, I'm saying no. Okay, well, why not? If you want to unmute yourself and tell us, tell us why not. Well, I love to see things like this. I love mm -hmm. to enjoy them and talk about them. But in my home, I like things that I think are beautiful. And okay. I don't think this is beautiful. <laughs> okay, so for your home decor, it maybe doesn't fit with your beautiful aesthetics that you're going for. But it's, it's interesting to look right. at, but not for the home. Okay. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? Would anyone want to have this hanging in their home? Is this anyone's sort of cup of tea in terms of, of humor or imagery? Hmm. hmm. Maybe in the kitchen. Maybe in the kitchen, okay, yeah. I mean, it really is an allegory of human behavior, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's go back to that idea just for one moment and then we'll move on to our next work. What is the, what is the commentary on human nature being made here? I mean, we've sort of talked about it a little bit about humans taking themselves seriously, but are there any other messages or meanings you're extrapolating from this work? And it's a big question. I don't necessarily have the answer to that. But if, if you've been struck with a profound thought, let us know. Uh, one thing, Laura, that springs to mind is just the, the very, very long literary history of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, going back to things like Aesop's fables, there's a, you know, there are many millennia of, of stories in which uh, the animals are the characters, but the uh, the message is really a moral one as far as how humans should live their lives. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes where something goes wrong and then the, the lesson is illustrated through that, but um, there's a, a parallel there with um, kind of the, the 
literary and oral tradition as well as here in the visual. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with a question that's hopefully a little bit easier and I'm very curious to hear your answer. Has anyone ever had a pet monkey? Or has anyone ever experienced a monkey in a domestic setting in any way? I certainly have not and I'm, I'm a little scared of monkeys but I'm curious if anyone has had that experience. <laughs> Yes, we have actually. You have. Tell us about it. Well, we were in Gibraltar a couple of years ago, and uh, <clears throat> trust me, you don't want to know what all of those monkeys were doing. <laughs> <in the mountain. laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but they were everywhere. They uh, were okay. Yeah, I, that would make me nervous. I don't, I don't like monkeys too much. They will come up and they'll sit on your shoulder. They sit on top of the car or bus or whatever but uh, they have no fear up there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they do some strange things while they're there, I could do it. Gosh. This strikes me as, uh, it's pre-Darwin, so it wasn't like he was trying to make a connection between us and our forebears. Uh, it's, to me, it's strange that people thought this was funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair point. I guess there's maybe it's a little bit just, whimsical or unexpected and maybe that was where the, the element of humor came in um but okay i promised you a corny joke with each painting so i'm going to move on to the next one but before i do i'm going to tell you my joke where do monkeys go to drink the monkey bars oh. <laughs> they're just gonna get worse they're just gonna get worse um so <laughs> brace yourselves um, okay so unless there's any last comments about this one let's move on to our next painting okay so this is one of my favorite paintings in the collection. Um, and a lot of you I know are familiar with this painting, but to me, it's almost like a 18th century Italian where's Waldo. You can just keep looking and looking and finding more details. And that's one of the reasons I like to return to it is I always find something new every time I teach with it. Um, so what is your eye drawn to first and what are some of the details you find as you continue to look? Um, and I recognize the challenges of, of trying to see a painting on your computer screen or your iPad screen, but what, just tell me some of the things you're noticing as you look at this painting. And I think, Liz, if you're, yeah, there you go, you're unmuted now. Yeah, uh, it's a market, I, mm -hmm. I think. It's a market, okay, yep, and how do we, what are you seeing that tells you it's a market? Um, all of the different stands, all of the different people, mm -hmm. different foods, and uh, it's like a dog's trying to get some. Yeah. It, it, to me, it's it's in contrast to this the center building, second story, with mm -hmm. an blue awning and uh, it's sort of grandiose. Whereas on the square, things look like normal everyday life in the city. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of really interesting comments here. So first of all, it's a market scene. There's food, there's people, there's dogs. So if you have dogs at home, you know they're going to be sniffing after the food. Um, but then, yeah, as we sort of, it's almost sort of divided in this interesting way where the, the bottom half of the canvas is, you know, quotidian people at a market, um, just living daily life. And then things get a little bit more formal as we move up the canvas, right? A little bit more stately. Um, so that's something I want to return to as we talk about this painting. But again, this idea of, um, class stratification and different social classes mingling or, or not. Um, so there's definitely that. So we've noticed the, the activities, the people, the setting. What else, what else do you notice going on in this painting? Is there a show going on or something? Because people are hanging out of windows all around the square watching it. And if it were a market, that would be a regular event rather than a, a spectator. Yeah, so really good observation. So something special must be happening, right? Because there's all of these people hanging out of their windows. And I have to say, sort of in this time of coronavirus, this image really resonated with me. Um, you see the people in Italy who are gathering on their balconies to try to be together in this time when they're, and obviously there's not a lot of social distancing going on down on the square. Um, but, you know, this this is Italy in 1756, um, and there's just so much sort of resonance with what's happening today. But yeah, so something important must be happening. If this is just the, the, the average market, um, you probably wouldn't have all these people gathering. So there's, there's something that's happening. Um, and and there's, there's something uh, in this absolute center of the screen, uh, like two people maybe getting married or something inside the building mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. I don't know if 
it's related to all the fanfare above it or if it's totally its own thing. And there you go. That's the, the detail I had never noticed before. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, if you look, and I'm now like sticking my face right into the camera to try to get close. Um, if you look at, right in the center of the painting under that sort of archway is the building um, sort of recedes. It almost seems like there's two people standing there having maybe a wedding ceremony or something happening that's a little formal. We will notice it next yeah. time. Um, okay, so maybe Erin, if you want to go to the next slide. And so here, here's sort of the reveal. I, and if I was teaching in the galleries, I wouldn't let you see the, the wall text that gives you the title. I would make you do more work, but you know, this is a digital thing. So uh, the, the artist and the title is there for you to see. It's the drawing of the lottery. Um, so that is the event that um, is, is taking place. Like you said, they're all sort of there for this moment where the winning ticket will be announced. Um, and I wanna return to that in a moment, but there's just still so much to see and take in. So I wanna walk you through some of the details of the painting. So Erin, if you can go to the next slide for us. So here's a close up of that, that central bottom part that's happening. So we've got the dog, we've got the horse. Um, and the man who is ostensibly the owner of the horse is in, in distress. And it sounds sort of dark for me to say this, but this was one of the elements I found a little bit comical about this painting. I'm sure the man would beg to differ, but just sort of the, the dramatic gesture that he's making. And it's sort of, you know, these, this overblown, oh my goodness, what's going on? And the poor horse has tumbled and it's the scene of chaos. So again, not, not funny, haha, and certainly not funny if you're that man. But um, these sort of moments of, of drama and, and big reactions, those big gestures. Um, and then personally, I'm a big fan of cheese. So I had to show you this detail of the cheese uh, table there, um, as well as the other, the other elements. And then if we go to the next, kind of just to reorient ourselves. Um, and then the next detail that I've got, uh, I'm trying to remember where that is. Erin, do you remember the next? It's in that sort of side area. So yeah, if we can zoom into that. Um, and again, just to kind of give you a sense of how crowded the square is, there's um, some animal carcasses and some like, it looks like tin and glass, um, baskets of fruit. Um, and then we'll go to, to one more detail, back to the big picture to orient you. And then we're gonna now move to the left side of the canvas. And again, here's the other element that I personally found humorous. It's the man plucking the melon trying to steal the melon and then making us complicit, you know, as he's kind of looking at us and shushing, um, is he's gonna, gonna steal the melon again. So it's not funny, haha, -ha, but you know, it's kind of like these little moments of, we're, it's an inside joke, if you will. Um, so as if we, if we go back to the, to the main one again. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, we're obviously all stuck in our homes right now. So I'm gonna ask you to just take this imaginative, imaginative leap of faith with me. If you could step into this scene, if you could be in this painting, what would you hear? What would you smell? What would you taste? What would you feel? Let's just imagine for a moment we can be transported to this world. Organized chaos. <laughs> chaos, okay. And what does chaos sound like? Organized chaos. Organized chaos, okay, I like that. Uh, we certainly hear dogs. Okay, we're hearing the dogs barking. What else? Like, you can hear the, the music horse. playing because they're playing on the balcony. Okay, okay, yeah, and I think, there. do I have a, do I have a detail of that, Erin, the, the balcony scene there? I'm not sure if I do. Oh, perfect, yeah, so you can hear the music. We've got those horns there um, and on other instruments, so we, we're hearing music. What else are you hearing in this scene? The horse, the poor horse. The poor horse is screaming, yeah, I mean, I'm yes. imagining he's just, probably, I mean, that's a, that's a bad, that's a bad fall there for a horse. We know that that's not going to end well, probably, for him. So and it's probably the dog's fault. The dog probably is the barking. dog's fault. Yeah, blame the dog. He spooked the horse, and the horse took a big tumble. So we've got these. Uh, we've got sort of like happy sounds with music, pomp and circumstance with the the distress of the horse, the barking of the dogs. Any any other sounds we might hear? Well, the man announcing the lotto when you showed that uh, close up just now mm -hmm. is probably yes. He's trying to shout over everything else. I don't yeah, know can how you anyone imagine? can hear yeah, Can you no. imagine trying to make yourself heard over the din of that market square? Impossible, especially Impossible. with the musicians right by him. Exactly, I know, it was a sensory overload for me. Um, what, a, what, a, what does it smell like in this, in this square? Right. Who wants to help us step into this right. world? People. People. <laughs> Smells like people, yeah, maybe 
sweaty people. It looks like a nice hot sunny day, although they're they're dressed rather warmly. What else? What else are we smelling? Uh, animals and overripe fruit and that oh, sort of thing. Oh, yes. Animals, overripe fruit. Yeah, that kind of sweet but mm -hmm. not so good smell of overripe yeah. fruit. Yeah. <laughs> I think ripe is a good word. Ripe, yes, just general <laughs> ripeness all around, right? The cheese, the people, the fruit. <laughs> Indeed. It's almost as though there's two paintings here. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the foreground are doing business in the market. They're not paying any attention to what's going on at the motto drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, people standing in the windows and balconies, uh, they're not really market interest people. They're, they're interested in the lotto. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's divided, it, you know, it's divided into daily commerce and the hope for great winnings. Yes, I like that. Yeah, so there's this this division that we had sort of alluded to earlier of people just going about their daily lives, people um, and then people maybe who are not even paying attention to the market who are really focused on the lottery. Um, but what I think is interesting about this painting too is that if you get really close, and I don't think I have any of these details, but some of the people in the market actually are holding lottery tickets and you can see they've got these little slips of paper with numbers on them. So I think this painting as a whole is sort of serves as a rumination on chance and fortune, right? So there are these people who are of a lower social class who maybe, yeah, and Aaron's pointing to one there, maybe if they win the lottery, their lives are all of a sudden changed in, a, in an instant, right? But then uh, things could go wrong just as quickly as the man with the horse illustrates. He's just lost his livelihood, right, in this freak accident. Um, and then and then if you zoom out a little bit thinking about, well, who are the working class people in this town and who are the people who are literally elevated, um, but socially as well, who maybe have these nice apartments in this beautiful square. Um, so, so sort of life as a game of chance and, and fortunes can can come and go um, and, and thinking about that a little bit, but and, and, and just a beautiful kind of mastery of, of detail and, and chaos on the part of the artist. Um, I know I've, I've been rambling for quite some time and I want to have Erin have, have plenty of time to share her paintings. Um, but any other comments about this one or any other thoughts about maybe its resonance for today? I mean, beyond the fact that there's no social distancing going on or anything that um, sort of speaks to you about this painting? It makes me wonder about your humor. Makes me, I know, I know. It was really a stretch for me to find funny works. The, the, guy, with the, the guy with the melons is a little funny, right? Like he's... <laughs> He's, he's stealing a melon, so that's funny, I guess. Laura, can I add something real quick? Yes, please do. I, um, I walked around the galleries last weekend with our chief preparator, who's also a professional artist, mm -hmm. and I took a couple video clips of him talking about composition in paintings. Mm -hmm. And what he was focused on was the use of the triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I, I mean, I've looked at this painting dozens and dozens and dozens of times and never really noticed, but now I have triangles on the brain, thanks to Keith, uh, that if, if you look at the um, the tents under which the, the goods are being sold there, or the little canopies or whatever they are, tarts in the foreground, as they recede into the distance, they the, the eye is led up ultimately to that canopy on the balcony, uh, and it makes a triangle which was one of the things Keith was talking about, about the, the point of the triangle being used to draw the eye to what should be the center of attention, which in this case is the subject, despite all the activity going on in this extraordinary piece, that it draws the eye up to that central point, which is where the title derives from and what the focus of the piece is. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've looked at this many, many times and that's never dawned on me, but looking at it on the screen, it seems obvious that there's that sort of triangular form in the center there created through the tarps and canopies. Mm -hmm. And um, it leads the eye to the, the selecting of the lottery ticket on the on the balcony. And I should mention too, um, the, the little, the person who's picking the winning lottery ticket is a little child and is maybe an orphan because um, these these kind of, state-sponsored lotteries would benefit charities, so orphanages, um, things like that. So that's probably why it's that little guy, and he's almost impossible to see, but a, a little child who is perhaps going to be a beneficiary. Um, okay, so I wanna, yeah, oh, there he is, the little, little cutie. Um, before I move on to our next painting, I've got a terrible joke for you. If you're already questioning my sense of humor, this is not going to help, but it's sort of art and lottery combined, so I had, it was perfect. So why did the paintbrush win the lottery? Just a stroke of good luck, I suspect. 
Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Um, okay. It. I'm going to turn I it over to Aaron now. Good. And if you Thank think you. of any jokes, please, please chime in. I'm clearly in need of some good material. So. Hi, this Hi. is Ingrid. I wonder oh, Ingrid, if you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Hi, Ingrid. Hi, how are you? I have you on my big screen desktop, which does not have a functioning microphone or camera, but I also dialed into the meeting on my smartphone, and that's what you're hearing me from, the Galaxy A10e that you see a little box under participants. That's me. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're able to join in because we, we want your voice as part of the conversation. So I have to tell you my favorite part of this painting is mm -hmm. the obscure little scene in the bottom left-hand portion by the melon seller. Mm -hmm. And it's that man who is trying to steal a melon mm -hmm. and he's looking out at us with his index finger up to his lips, telling us all to be quiet and not let the melon seller know what he's doing. Exactly, exactly. He's making us you know, complicit in his misdeed, which I would argue is sort of humorous. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe I a tiny bit. Maybe a tiny humorous bit. part of the painting. Yeah, definitely. All right, so I, I want to leave plenty of time for Aaron. So Aaron, do you want to move us to our next painting? Sure. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, so uh, what's going on in this image here? I'm searching for humor with some difficulty here. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, as Lauren mentioned, you know, some of these are stretched. <laughs> so hopefully as we... The humor that I find in this, it's Ingrid here, by the way. Mm -hmm. The humor I find in this is Venus attempting to retain the attention of Mars, who looks totally annoyed at her insistence. Okay. And uh, what specifically about Mars' expression makes you say that he looks annoyed? And I have well, a look at the way oh, he's yes. leaning his head on mm -hmm. his left arm. His brows are furrowed. We can see the little lines above his mm -hmm. nose, uh, the stress annoyance lines. Mm -hmm. And look at the expression on his face. It's as if he's saying, hey, woman, leave me alone. Yeah, okay, so we're seeing, we're looking at his posture here, um, the way his head is kind of turned towards the woman standing next to him, um, and, and the, the way his brow is kind of furrowed. He, he looks like he's being bothered, and he just wants maybe some space. Like, he's like, just please. I, we've, we've, maybe they've been isolated for an extended period of time, and they're ready for, <laughs> for some What we call coronavirus stress. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, what other um, details are we noticing that stand out to you that might maybe read as humorous or maybe they don't read as humorous to you um, in terms of, you know, the expressions or the way these um, figures are interacting with one another? What can we tell about what's going on here? I can't tell what this is. What are you What are you looking at, Liz? Um, that that you're trying to piece together. I might have a detail of it. The uh, fellow on the far left. We we can't tell what is growing out of his back. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I think I have too small. We we just don't know. And yeah, also, it's a big wing. It, oh yeah, it is a wing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it looked a little weird. Yeah. And <laughs> we can't tell what is in his left hand some kind of lace or something mm -hmm. that and he's he's steering it's a mesh it's mesh <laughs> it's he's oh yes it is a it's like a net then isn't it so and the baby is saying no thank you yeah we can't tell why <laughs> netting the baby or the you know the cupid or whatever is we don't know the story there Sure. Well, how would you describe this? Let's let's try and unpack this interaction here. How would you describe this figure's expression and his gesture here? What does that say to you? Very serious. Okay. This is not humor. Okay, so he he is ha finding no fun in this. Whatever is going on here, he he seems very serious to you. 
And then what about the um, the baby here? Uh, I think someone said that he looks like he's saying no thank you. What what do you see about his pose or his expression that makes you say that? Not a happy baby. <laughs> Not a happy baby. And is there anything in particular that makes you read it like that? That means he doesn't seem happy to you in any particular way? The lack of facial uh, expression that shows acceptance or happiness or uh, connectivity. Okay. Okay. So his expression is a reading is he's finding any joy or pleasure in, in this interaction here. And then the figure that he is uh, engaging with looking back at um, doesn't seem to be having any fun here either. They're both very kind of serious um, in this interaction. Oh, yeah. What else stands out to you um, in this image? How would you read her expression here? We've kind of talked about these other three figures, but what about this female figure? How does her expression and her gesture read to you? So Erin, I'll make a modern and very flippant comment. I know it's not the story, but basically feeding on some of the previous comments, I would say that she's saying to him, either this is your child or we're adopting this kid. And he's saying, really? Seriously? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> and the kid, the kid is looking at granddad and saying, oh, I'm not sure about you either. <laughs> but I know that's not the story. But if you put a modern twist on it, it could be that. His okay. expression and hers are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I appreciate that. So like maybe say, um, that's the humorous comment. Yeah, like a, a like an episode on like the Geraldo Rivera show or like something like that. And she's like, hey, we met, you know, 10 years ago, by the way, here's your son. Um, <laughs> and, they, they bring the deal. Um, and so this figure here is like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry, I created my own humor. But yeah, it could I, be that. I appreciate that and I can see that there um, in their <laughs> their expressions. Um, any, any other possible um, readings that we're seeing or, or emotions um, in this female figure here? But the very young and the very old are represented. Okay, yeah, so we're seeing this distinction between the youthfulness of our figures here, um, and especially our, our little child, um, and then the, the, um, this older figure here on the far left. So there's this distinction between youth and, and age here. Good. Anything else that's standing out to us in this image? Ingrid here. Yeah. We notice the scythe that the old man is holding which of course would be the symbol of father time. So he looks quite serious. In fact, almost, oh, how do I say? Um, hmm. Judgmental in looking down at the child. Okay, so great. So Ingrid's drawn our attention to what our, uh, our, our elderly figure here on the far left um, is holding and it's, she's identified it as a scythe, which is often an attribute um, attributed to the personification of, of time, this human depiction of this intangible um, concept or, or thing, right? Um, and so for Ingrid, his expression reads as um, judgmental, um, whereas other people have, have, have interpreted it as serious. So we're adding like another layer here to what his expression might read to us as. Um, so if this is, is time, then perhaps he's you know, looking down on this baby and maybe casting some form of, of judgment here. Um, uh, and time is also a very serious thing, right? A serious concept, right? Um, and we're experiencing time maybe a bit differently now in our current situation. Um, maybe the days are starting to blend together for you. I know they are for me. <laughs> um, and you don't, it's hard to keep track of the days of the week. Um, so time just seems to be kind of very, you know, fluid right now. Um, so here we have this personification of time. Um, what and anything else that's standing out to us in this? I think the humor here really is that's the early personification of Donald Trump's hair, and I think that's what uh, that. Uh, <laughs> the <origin> <laughs> 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 
he does have a very, <laughs> you know, a very you know particularly coiffed uh, hair type here, um, and it seems to be kind of like pulled forward um, towards the front of his of his face here, and you know he's got this very long beard too, right? Which you know um, kind of adds to this. Um, distinction between age and um, and and youthfulness that um, someone brought up earlier too. So, I'm um, kind of further emphasizing the distinction between himself and and these uh, younger uh, figures here on the far right. Yeah. So this. Um, oh, sorry. Did someone else have a comment? It's Father Tom. To know it's interesting to see the difference in complexion between the baby and the lady and the two men. The two men have very normal looking complexion colors, whereas the woman is just pale white, almost uh, sculptural, and the baby is quite pink. Yeah, that's an interesting um, element to note too, and kind of distinguishing between the different figures in this picture or in this painting is the, um, the, the tone of their skin as well to kind of identify and, and highlight um, maybe this uh, female figure. She's, you know, in the center of the composition also, um, but she really does, her, her pale skin really does stand out, especially against that dark background there, kind of drawing our attention to her. And then we have this like pinky uh, colored baby here, um, kind of emphasizing his, his youthfulness um, and, and his like little fleshy baby body there, um, especially compared to these um, more, tanned uh, <laughs> figures that we see on either side with almost like ruddy, a ruddy complexion here on our male figure here on the right. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, Liz, what did you want to, to share? I was thinking, is father, the father time character netting this baby with the intent of cutting it with the scythe? I mean, is this saying I have, I have control over you uh, and the baby is pushing back saying not yet, not yet? Yeah, that's it, that's interesting, right? Um, so it does look like our our figure, our father time figure here, um, is certainly you know trying to capture this child in some way, right? The netting is is draped over part of the infant's um, body, and he is the infant is reacting to having this um, net draped over him. Um, so perhaps you know the father time is is meaning to you know uh, capture the baby for some means to an end. Um, which is an interesting point. Um, is anybody else reading that interaction in, a, in another way or, or um, maybe slightly differently? The baby doesn't appear to be very worried for his safety. I think he just objects to having himself caught in a net. Yeah, who, I mean, who wants to be caught in a net, right? Like. <laughs> Um, sure, yeah, and, and, and the way his hand is raised and his foot is kind of lifted up, almost trying to push the nettings off of his body there, um, certainly. Anyone else have any other um, interpretations for this interaction here? It's um, interesting because this is kind of the, the central, uh, you know, you have this story being played out in just these four um, characters set in this kind of, you know, very sparse setting here. Um, this story itself was inspired by ancient mythology and it um, harkens to the, uh, the tale of um, Venus, um, the goddess of love, and her lover Mars, um, the god of war, uh, which Ingrid identified for us earlier here. And then this um, infant figure here is actually Cupid, their, their love child. Um, and so Venus um, was actually married to the god Vulcan and uh, had an affair with Mars on the side. And so Vulcan um, wanted to expose their relationship to the amusement of the other gods, kind of, you know, expose them, have everybody laugh at them. Um, and so he fashioned this uh, golden net to capture um, the, uh, the, 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 the lovers and Cupid and, and reveal them to, to the gods. Um, so here we have Father Time who, who looks very Vulcan-like with his long beard and um, he's depicted um, as an older, older gentleman. Uh, so this 
Vulcan-like personification of time is the one who is actually ensnaring our, our Cupid here. And our artist is using this story to kind of illustrate this idea that insatiable uh, desire can actually um, squelch love. So in our initial, you know, reading of this interaction between um, Venus and Mars, this idea that, you know, she is trying to, you know, keep his attention, she wants affection, um, and Mars appears to be kind of bored and over her, and like, I need my space, get off, you know what I mean, and like, go find something else to do, um, is this idea that the insatiable love, the insatiable passion of Venus is actually kind of um, subduing the, the love between them um, and cooling their, the, the feelings that Mars uh, has for her. Um, I so guess I, one could say he's just not that into you. Yeah, yes, yeah, it does go back to that, yeah, that saying, he is just not that into you. Um, this could totally be in that, there's a movie based on that book, I believe it's a book, um, and this could totally be on the cover of that. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, I think the humor here is really in the way the artist has kind of captured um, this, the, the, the expressions of these figures, and they're kind of almost like caricaturized to me in a way, the, the, the expression of Mars and then Venus with her like, come hither, like, pay attention to me, what are you doing, um, look, and, um, and, and all of this was meant to kind of, you know, amuse the, the, the gods, and they would have the opportunity to, to laugh at Venus and Mars for being caught by the husband of Venus, um, Vulcan here. Any other thoughts or comments about this scene? Does anybody find it funnier now that we've kind of unpacked it a little bit more or is it still seem like, seem like a bit of a stretch for us? <laughs> well, Erin, I guess it depends on what you call funny. I mean, yeah. yes, he's got it. <laughs> like several of us commented, <laughs> I'm not sure. How funny it is that it depends on which side you're standing. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Like, are you are you in the pose of are you standing in the position of, of Vulcan? Are you in the if you're in the position of Venus or of Mars, you know, or if you're in the position of being one of the other gods who gets to watch this drama unfold and kind of, you know, um, what is the the German phrase? Um, schadenfreude is that it like where you like take pleasure in the you know perils of other people and the drama of other people's lives um so you know it might depend on just where where you what your role is in this story where whether or not you find the humor in it and of it's course david too when you look at father time because and Vulcan was an older man older than Venus. It was an arranged and unwanted marriage as far as she was concerned. And so you wonder whether the father time figure is also a stand-in for Vulcan. Yeah, I think that's definitely an, a, a valid, um, you know, reading of this figure that he is this kind of Vulcan-like um, representation of time. The fact that he is depicted um, older, he has this very long beard, and then he's holding on to this golden net, which Vulcan, ha you know, in the story, Vulcan has um, forged himself. So yeah, I think that's um, a perfectly, a totally valid um, reading here of this figure. Great. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to pass the proverbial mic back to Laura for our next um, joke to get us to our, our next painting. Are y'all ready for this one? What happened when two angels fell in love? They lived harpily ever after. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know, it's so bad. I know, I know. Moan. Um, Aaron, I'm wondering, do you want to just do your second painting? We're a little short on time. I'm fine either way with... Yeah, I could, uh, it's up to you. I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to jump to the halls and... Okay, that sounds okay. good. Because I've got some good jokes for that one. Just oh, wait. Boy. Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, so this is going to be the last work we're going to explore together, um, and it's a portrait um, by a, 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 a Dutch painter, Frans Hals. So um, how would you describe this man and um, his expression? Somber. 
Somber. And what do you see um, specifically that makes you say somber, Liz? I'm looking at his eyes, his furrowed brow. Okay. So we're seeing a furrowed brow and his, and his eyes that that reads to you as somber. Good. Mm -hmm. Any other um, interpretations for his expression here or what else we can tell about this figure based on you know, his dress, his posture? Erin, um, I'd like to pop in. Yes, Jill, go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I, I haven't found the hand raising mechanism, so I'm just, I'm just um, popping in. I've always thought a great word uh, to describe Peter Alakan was avuncular. Uh, to me, he looks like, you know, quote unquote, the Dutch uncle. To me, uh, yes, there's a somberness to it. I totally see that. But also a kind of um, good spirit. Okay, great. Yeah. So there's this kind of like, uh, you know, he, perhaps, you know, maybe he does kind of seem a little somber here. But the, underneath that, we're seeing, you know, this maybe like good hearted nature that might come out at any moment here. Mm -hmm. um, like like the uncle that might crack a joke or something like that and brings a good sense of humor to the, 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 the holiday dinner table. <laughs> what else can we tell about this figure? What other kinds of uh, impressions does this portrait give you about this man who he might be? Aaron, I'd say from his hand that we can see, he looks like a working man. Mm. It's not the delicate white soft skin of someone who is pampered and does nothing. Okay, so you're seeing a bit of, um, you know, maybe that he, he works with his hands in some way. They don't seem like that pale, pristine um, skin that we just saw maybe in Venus um, just a few moments ago. Okay. Absolutely not. Also that he spends some time outside. I think the different tones are supposed to show that he's slightly sun-kissed. Ah, okay. Also on his face, kind of ruddy skin. Okay, great. So maybe he's maybe he's uh, someone who has been outside at some point. He's not living completely indoors. He's not uh, self isolating here. Um, and <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. But I think he's quite prosperous. His clothing reflects uh, some degree of wealth and prosperity. Mm -hmm. at the same time. Okay, so at the same time that we're seeing, you know, maybe perhaps he does do some sort of work with his hands, um, but we're also seeing that he does seem, appear to be uh, a figure of some so, sort of social standing based on the, the, the outfit that he's wearing, what he's dressed in. Great. Uh, Liz, I see your hand is raised. It, it looked like velvet, like midnight velvet with a reflection of light, mm -hmm. and the, the lace ruff he's wearing is multi-leveled and very dense. So I, I, I thought he represented some wealth. And it looks like there's a family coat of arms or something in the upper right-hand corner. And um, I'm not sure that that's something that most everybody had, but rather people who had some wealth. Yeah, or great. Lineage, or lineage of some sort. Mm -hmm. So building on this idea that he is a, ma a man of some sort of social standing based on the, the textiles of his, of his outfit as well here, we've got, you know, rich uh, velvet, we have this beautiful lace uh, collar here that's very dramatic and kind of highlighting um, his face for us here. And then too, that we have this coat of arms um, hanging behind him, which also would have been a marker that he was a part of a family of some sort of social standing. Great. Uh, Ingrid. Hi. The impression, the impression that I have of him is that he's someone who has made his own way in the world, made his own wealth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's not really uh, taken with himself. Notice his hair. He hasn't really made a point of being fabulously coiffed. The hair is just wild. And uh, I don't see his expression as being gruff. In fact, I see that he's got a smile just an instant away. If you look at the lines on the sides of his eyes, particularly his right eye to our left, that line that curves up is uh, a, a slaff line. And so I think he's someone who's a pretty congenial fellow. Mm -hmm. And it looks as though his lips are parted, as if he's just getting ready to tell us something. 
perhaps a bad joke. <laughs> So maybe he's got some some uh, corny jokes like Laura has been sharing with us. He's got one in his pocket ready to ready to share at any moment here. Okay, great. Perhaps. <laughs> so we're unpacking this expression um, a little bit further here. And, and so, you know, while he does kind of maybe appear a little bit somber at first, when we look even more carefully, we're seeing a bit of a, a sense of animation in this expression that it, maybe at any moment he's going to uh, smile or um, perhaps, you know, tell, tell a joke. Any other thoughts about what he might, if he were to, you know, come to life in this moment, any other thoughts about what he might say to us in this moment here? No, but I agree about the hair, mm -hmm. but if you look at his face, he's uh, been close shaven and his beard has been trimmed. So you're right, the, the hair looks a little disheveled, but the, the rest of him looks uh, pretty clean. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting point. So maybe while he hasn't like taken the time to like run a comb through his hair, he still has put some thought into his, um, the way he's, he's being presented here, right? So he's kept his, uh, goatee like nice nicely trimmed here um, and 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 clean shaved on the sides so good yeah well I think um, some of our, our comments about this the expression of our sitter here um, is is a hallmark of this artist's um, style Franz Halls was known for these very lively animated um, portraits that are a result of his very fluid brushwork, his way of kind of um, rapidly uh, handling the paint on the canvas. And I see, I think we can see that um, represented not only here in his expression, but also um, as Mary drew our attention to his hands here, that they almost appear, you know, as if at any moment they might kind of start to move here. And we can really see um, Halls's use of, of, of the paint or application of the paint here. And um, his ability to bring uh, a liveliness and sort of a, a sense of spiritedness to his portraits is what really drew um, members of the, the wealthy uh, middle class um, to, to Halls, that they wanted his, uh, him to paint their portrait. Um, Peter Olicon, um, our sitter here, he was a wealthy brewer um, and also was the mayor of Harlem um, at one point. So he was a man of, so of great social standing. Um, his family had uh, Franz Halls paint a number of portraits for them, including uh, Peter Olicon's wife um, that we see here. This is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Um, and if we look at them, you know, side by side, you know, we can see she's, um, sit, is sitting down um, as well. She's got her a Bible here, and we also see that we have her coat of arms here in the um, upper left. But if we look at um, uh, Mrs. Olicon, <laughs> I'm not going to try and pronounce her first name because I'll butcher it. Uh, but if we look at Mrs. Olicon, uh, we could see again this kind of almost maybe slight um, smile that we have here. Um, and this is also another kind of hallmark of Franz Hals's portraits. He was known for depicting um, uh, figures who, you know, had some sort of um, you know, smile, either a big, it ranged from like a big broad grin to maybe just a twinkle in the eye. Um, and I have some other examples of Franz Hall's work here. Um, this one uh, is called The Laughing Cavalier. This is a later title added, applied to the work, but I think it kind of highlights the, 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 the humor and the, the swagger that we see in this uh, figure here. But again, kind of seeing this slight glimmer, twinkle to the eye, maybe as if he's about to like chuckle at a joke or something like that. Um, and then we have these other uh, genre portraits, um, portraits of these sort of uh, figures from that represent the, the, the lower working classes. So uh, entertainers, um, laborers, and, and peasants. And in these sorts of portraits, we see the the more um, obvious and more exaggerated um, smiles and expressions here. 
um, for example, this portrait of a fisherman where we can actually see he's, he's got a big uh, toothy grin. Um, and so these types of portraits of, of, of lower class people um, were really meant to, you know, uh, remind us of, you know, the, the, the need for moderation and, and temperance and how a person behaved, that these um, members of, of the, the lower class, they were often used to, to highlight the, the, the joys of worldly pleasure and, 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 and taking pleasure in the senses, but they also would have this sort of moral message um, underlying them, reminding us to, while you can, you know, enjoy life's good pleasures, you know, don't overdo it um, and don't overindulge and, and remember to, to still behave yourself. If we go back to Franz Hals, though, I, I um, you know, we have this sort of, we've talked about, you know, he seems a little bit somber, but there's, uh, you know, just this slight hint that he might break out into a smile at some point here or, or at any moment. Um, and so I want to ask, uh, now that we've looked at some examples of Franz Hals' other work, how might your impression of Peter Olicon change if he were to be depicted with like a big toothy grin? How might your reading of this portrait change? Aaron, one of the things I've always loved this painting, it's one of my favorites in the collection, um, the black that he's wearing uh, based on who this is and who painted him and the time in which it was painted, it, it, it probably indicates either being a member of the Protestant faith or possibly um, being affiliated with Stoicism. Uh, which would have been a, a philosophy, kind of an adherence to logic that would have been prevalent at the time. Um, so you have these, in a sense, sort of conservative streaks, but then when you, you read the face, um, and I, the thing I love most about it is, of course, the rough, uh, which is just huge and, and bordering on the ridiculous. Um, you know, that there's this element of personality that runs sort of counter to the conservatism Mm -hmm. or stoicism of his, his garment. Um, and I can't remember whether it's um, Black Adder or uh, it's another one of the, the British um, comedies of, of many years ago, but where there's a, a sequence where these, these figures one up each other with increasingly large and elaborate roughs, almost to the point where it becomes um, I mean, they, they can't see and they can't speak and they can't breathe, but they're, they've, they've had, uh, you know, they've gone to such extremes to show their wealth and sophistication and their, their, their fashion. This isn't quite there, but it's, um, that would be definitely a rough to reckon with for sure. And um, it's, it's always uh, given me a smile every time I see it because it's otherwise a very sort of serious portrait with these elements that are depending on the lens through which you, you view them, you know, they are somewhat comical. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it's interesting too, to think about, you know, the fact that he's, um, you know, dressed rather soberly, right? In black and white, right? Very, you know, there's not a lot of color going on here, um, but he's still kind of participating in those worldly pleasures, but in a tempered way, right? Because there is still this, uh, sense of the richness of the the clothing, the richness of the textiles that are being used, and then as you mentioned, this kind of almost bordering on ridiculous uh, sized rough that we have going on here, but all but still tempered, right? Not just just pushing it, but not going too far over the top. Um, well, he is a brewer after all. He is a brewer after all. Yeah, so you would imagine he knows how to have a good time, right? <laughs> He knows the benefits of a good pint, um, but not overdoing it, right? <laughs> uh, Ingrid, I see your hand is raised. I'm wondering, is it just me, or does he have an earring in his right earlobe, or is that just the wild hair? Oh, let's see. Let me get back to the close-up of his face. Oh, I think that's the hair. Does yeah. that look like yeah, an earring? I, I do think it's, I think it's his hair, although there are other portraits in the collection where you have uh, a gold hoop, single gold hoop, but the other sitters in our collection. Hmm. But I could see- Which is a little unusual, but it- Yeah, Bonaventure, uh, Father Beasy. Right. 
Yeah, uh, Sarah Cartwright, is, uh, our curator of collections, is doing work on that that painting, and the the earring is a major topic of discussion amongst her and her colleagues. Mm -hmm. There are um, uh, those these gold hoops that show up in in some of these paintings of this period, and and there's some question as to the significance because they're usually a point is being made. Uh, when they're included, and it's what does it mean, and what how does it associate with with others that are wearing it? Well, I don't think he's a pirate. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> All right. Well, I I just want to we wanted to also highlight um, front, uh, this portrait by Franz Hals as well, too, because we do have um, you know hopefully later this year. Um, some of our exhibition schedule is a little bit in flux, so we don't have an exact date at this moment, but. Um, later this year, hopefully, we will have um, an exhibition featuring Franz Halls, and we'll uh, get to reunite our um, portrait of Pierre Olacan with another portrait of Olacan by Franz Halls as well. So um, stay tuned for more information about that, and hopefully you'll get to come out and, and, and see um, a, a whole ex exhibition about Franz Halls. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back to, to Laura for one final joke because I know she said I she have two, actually. I couldn't right. decide. Okay. <laughs> so they're both about beards because that was, you know, what I thought about. So um, the first is saying you have a beard when you don't makes you a bald faced liar. <laughs> <laughs> and then my other one is what is the beard's favorite kind of nut? Mustachio. <laughs> oh, Where did you get these? <laughs> it's a treasure trove. You just Google bad jokes or dad jokes or corny jokes, yeah. and there is everything you could possibly imagine. Um, so we've gone almost an hour and 15 minutes. It's incredible. I, I, the time really flew by for us, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves. It's, it's kind of nice to be able to sit comfortably in your home and enjoy rather than mm -hmm. have to stand in a gallery to look at paintings. So there's a bright side to the, the current closure. Um, but thank you so much for, for jumping in and trying this with us. Um, if this is something that's of interest, we can continue to offer these virtual gallery talk experiences. Um, and just know that we are hard at work behind the scenes developing all kinds of other ways we can engage with you online. So again, if there's things you want to see from us or content that you're looking for, just let us know um, and we'll, we'll stay in touch down the road. Good. Thank, thank you. you, Laura. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Laura. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Laura. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll, we'll see you all soon, hopefully. Thanks so much again, Laura okay, and Aaron. <laughs>